welcome everybody. My name is Tony Margiotta and I'm the GM here at Rise in London. And as always, before we start, um, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's attending and to all our illustrious speakers. We've got a cr cracking panel today. This is our Rise Presents uh, session. And the, topic, and the topic, of course, is from financial inclusion to inclusive finance. What is RISE? Very quickly, RISE, created by Barclays, is a global community of the world's top innovators working together to create what we believe is the future of financial services. Our mission is to connect technology, talent, and trends from the RISE network to accelerate innovation and growth in the financial industry. We have two locations here in London, and we've got a fantastic club in NYC in New York, and we speak, both teams speak every day, so it's great. And a combined community, I don't know, around just 100 companies, FinTech companies. But it's all about today. And today, we, as I said, we've got a fantastic panel headed up by Andrea Mario Constantino, who is the moderator. He's from Lycus Ventures. And the rest of you, just bear with me on some of the pronunciations. We also have Sam Abrika, who is the CEO and co-founder at Nova Money. We have the notorious Chris Skinner, author, speaker, and the bit I love, troublemaker, who's here. We have Vivek Maglani, Maglani CEO, founder at Multiply, who were members here at Rise, and we still keep connected to them, guys. Julio Rindi, who's the CFO Latin America for Masterclass. Welcome. Maximilian Rafaga, CEO of Finamize. And we were going to have Carice Gray from Barclays, but she had to unfortunately cancel at the last minute. Not before, though. She managed to get a very cool standing from Barclays with Stuart Sliper, Head of Money Management, Insights and Coaching. Welcome all, and I'd love now to hand you over to Andrea. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tony, and thank you to all the panelists to, to join this meeting today. Um, as the title suggests, uh, what we want to do today here is to discuss a topic, is an open conversation. Of course, there will be some uh, guidelines and themes and questions that we'll try to answer with our, with our amazing guests. Um, but ideally, what we would like to crack on with is why we should talk about financial inclusion and inclusive finance, or why we shouldn't focus just on financial inclusion, which is a major challenge these days, but also look at it from a different perspective, um, which is inclusive finance. And to do this, we have a very good, again, as Tony mentioned, a very good panel. We have the entrepreneurs, right? So we have Max, Sam, Vivek, who run companies that are involved on a daily basis on these kind of topics. And we also have the institutional leaders, the thought leaders, uh, well, Stuart in this case, Chris and Julio. Um, I will start maybe leaving, uh, giving like five to two, three minutes each you, to you guys so you can maybe explain, you know, why you've been chosen and what you guys do on a daily basis. And then we will give, we will give a bit more background uh, to the attendees to understand what we want to discuss here. Who feels like wants to start? Let's start with you, Chris. Oh, sorry, um, I, I, I didn't. I didn't catch. So, hi, um, I'm Chris Skinner. Who Tony, you called me notorious. Um, some other other people call me much worse names. Um, and yeah, I do liberally um, call myself a troublemaker because I tend to point my finger around the industry at the parts that most people don't want want to talk about because they're embarrassed by it. Uh, particularly the legacy systems and legacy structures and legacy products of the traditional financial firms. I write a blog every day that, at thefinancer.com, um, and it literally is every single day and has been for over 13 years, which has resulted in 19 books, of which a few are behind me, Digital Human Doing Digital, the most recent. And part of the reason I've been called here, I guess, is because I spend all my time researching and observing what's going on in the industry and outside the industry and bring finance and technology together, which makes me known as a fintech guy, 
but um, you know, finance and technology have always been together. It's just that they are now moving into a much more open banking structure, which changes things. But equally, within the fintech community, there's much more focus on doing very specialised capabilities that traditionally financial institutions couldn't do, which does include financial inclusion. So in Digital Human, a third of the book is dedicated to a case study on Ant fin Financial, which is now Ant Group, um, the sister company of Alibaba in China that's all about financial inclusion. Um, and equally, inclusive finance is about reaching the parts that traditional financial firms couldn't reach until we had open platforms and the internet, such as providing financial literacy and financial wellness. And one of the things I love today is the innovations around um, creating connectivity with people who maybe find money stressful because they've never been educated in money or people who have illnesses, particularly the elderly, where they can no longer monitor their money or they might get subjected to scams and they can connect through apps to their kids and their grandchildren if they have them so that they can monitor their accounts for unusual activity. And the world is changing very quickly in that, um, you know, one of my favorite examples is the way in which India changed in the last decade from having something like 65% uh, of citizens unbanked in 2010 to having only 15% of citizens unbanked by 2018. And that's because they've really used the capabilities of technology to revolutionize the country. So we'll probably touch on all those themes as we go through this panel discussion. But basically, I'm someone who speaks my mind um, and say it as I see it. Excellent. Thanks very much, Chris. Hey, Sam. How about Sam from Nova Money? Hey, everybody. My name is Sam. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nova Money, uh, which is an AI financial planner, which helps people plan their long-term goal and what they really want in life and then track their spending. And when they track their spending, then they can see the impact of their daily, behavior, daily behaviors on their long-term effect. And what we want to do is help people realize that actually a lot of their behaviors and their daily spending, they don't really originate from them. They, they just buy what other people want because we have so much advertising and uh, everybody believes that their role in life is, is to buy stuff. And instead, we want to empower people to focus on what they really want. And for a lot of people, they want, for example, um, to buy a house, to pay off the debt, to be financially free. And if they really want something and can focus on it and can adjust their daily behaviors, then there's a plan for that. And uh, that's why, that's why I, I created Nova Money. So we just launched uh, this year and uh, we were number one on product hunt. So we're very happy about it and uh, now preparing, uh, hopefully, our US launch. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much. Vivek from Multiply. So, hey, everyone. Yeah, I'm the CEO of Multiply, um, and we at Multiply help people achieve their goals, hopes, and aspirations. We have an app uh, which provides uh, advice across people's savings, investments, uh, pension, life insurance, basically holistically. Uh, and we combine, combine that advice with um, the infrastructure to implement those recommendations. And really our, our vision for the future is what we call autonomous finance, where, where people will have money moved to the right products, the right time, the right amount, uh, such that they closely align with what they would achieve in the future. My background is very much in the finance industry, spent um, 13 years in finance, mostly as a derivatives trader. In my last two years, was very close to the world of financial advice. Saw firsthand the impact it could have on people, particularly uh, the kind of emotional impact beyond the kind of financial economic impact. Um, and but but also saw that it, you know the service was very much restricted to to those who could afford it, uh, and and kind of democratizing that service and and increasing and, and and basically making it more inclusive was was very much a driving force behind what we did. Uh, in terms of automating it and, and, and providing access to as many as we can. Um, where we are today is that we're very much focused on, on two, uh, two primary goals. The first is helping people buy their first home, uh, and the other is helping people build their wealth. Excellent. Thanks very much. Uh, Julio from Moscow. 
Hey, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Tony and Andrea, for the kind invitation. Uh, my name is Giulio. Uh, 20 years uh, in international finance roles across the globe. I lived in three continents. I worked for uh, audit consulting uh, companies first. Uh, then I moved to heavy industrial uh, organization like Pirelli. Uh, then moved on to American Express in the global uh, business travel uh, services industry and then the FX uh, kind of sector. And then nine years ago, I joined MasterCard, which took me in a round the world trip. I spent the last six years uh, in emerging markets. And uh, I think uh, I'm here because these six years really uh, opened my eyes uh, uh, on the opportunity of financial inclusion uh, that we have in front of us. So I will be happy to share some of my learnings and findings uh, uh, during my, my journey. Thanks very much. Uh, Max, Cinemont? Yes, hi. Um, can you hear me all right? Perfect. Uh, cool. I uh, have to check. I just have to set up a better microphone. Uh, so my name is Max. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, Thinemize. Um We are ultimately trying to build a modern financial information platform and community. Um, so in essence, what we do is we have uh, two things or really two pillars. We have content that we produce in-house. Um, we have a team of analysts who used to work at Goldman Sachs, at Fidelity, uh, et cetera, people who really know what they're talking about. And uh, they try and share all of the insights that they get from all day thinking and reading and speaking uh, to, to other research analysts and condense it down into key insights that they can then share um, with the modern retail investor in 15 minutes a day. Um, it's available through a newsletter, uh, through mobile apps, and available in text and audio. And then we have a really, really active community. Um, last year, more than 30,000 people um, connected via meetups that we host all over the world that are hosted completely by uh, our own members on a voluntary basis. Um, and that made us the largest financial gathering in the world uh, by quite some distance. And this year we're on track to connecting 60,000 people. Um, and really where we see ourselves sort of in the overall ecosystem is specifically in the retail investment space where um, there's been a lot of innovation on the infrastructure side. Um, and there's a lot of talk around democratization of financial markets, um, which I think the infrastructure is part of it. And, and, and what it's done is uh, it's reduced barriers to, rent, to entry, uh, fractional share, zero commission, all of that stuff. Um, and that's opened the, the, the gate. Uh, and, and more and more retail investors are coming into the market. Uh, last year alone, 10 million um, retail investors entered the market in the U.S. alone. Um, this year, Charles Schwab announced in Q1 that they had more retail investors open accounts than all of 2020. So it's an accelerating um, growth there. And what, and, and what we see is that there's a really, really big vacuum in the market uh, where uh, the modern retail investor doesn't have access to in quality uh, investing information or investing insights. Um, the existing solutions are very, very expensive. Um, and often very, very convoluted and complex to wrap your head around. And so that's why I think we're seeing people turn to these free platforms like um, pseudo finance gurus on TikTok. I'm sure we have all heard of them. P people who just got a stimulus check and are now trying to tell you what the ne next altcoin is. Um, obviously, the rise of Reddit. And I think there's amazing stuff on Reddit, but there's also a lot of noise out there. Um, and what we really see our, our role in this ecosystem is to provide an affordable solution uh, to the modern retail investor who is time poor, who's community driven, and who also wants to learn by doing. Um, and that's the, the vacuum that we're trying to, to plug and help fill, and thereby fully actually democratize financial markets as part of the ecosystem. Thanks, Max. That's great. And Stuart Barkley. Great to come off mute there. So, yeah, hello all, and uh, thanks for having me here today. So, a quick bit about me. Um, I've worked in the banking sector for the past 11 years, and uh, I'd say that I've spent my time attempting to use technology to help people bank better so they can live better. Um, 
everywhere from my very first job where I was part of a team in South Africa focused on uh, entry level and inclusive banking, which aimed to improve access to financial services for lower income customers, um, to later running digital banking in Barclays, Uganda, um, back in 2012 and 2013, where I was able to um, observe the absolute explosion of mobile banking led by mobile network operators in East Africa. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to work in premier banking in Botswana and uh, later digital banking in the UK. I now spend my time working in a team that tries to help customers manage their money better. Um, and just something, to, something that I've observed in my travels is that uh, there's value in places that I, I call the Goldilocks places. And, and these, I think, are the places where there are real problems and the resources to address real problems. Um, by resources, I mean capital and, and humans. And so often there's one or the other. So it plays with all the knowledge and capital, but very few problems, because the problems have been solved mostly, even if suboptimally, um, by existing, uh, by yesterday's technology. Or it plays with lots of problems, but not much capital and few highly skilled technologists to attempt to solve the problem. So I've got a personal interest in finding these sort of um, Goldilocks places where both uh, capital, knowledge, and problems coexist um, as just really interesting case study places. So it's great to be here. Thanks. Awesome, Stuart. Thank you. And finally, let me hand over to the moderator, Andrea. It's all yours and a little bit about you again. Thank you very much. Right. So if we start from my introduction, right, and then we heard from all the uh, all the panelists, we we you know we understand that there is a very wide background here in terms of finance, but also like social impact. Now, as you heard from most of them, we talk a lot about financial inclusion, and this is one of the major challenges. Let's say FinTech is an industry that has been growing a lot in the last years. And of course, now it's focusing on more uh, specific issues and problems. Now, um, of course, we, are, we have plenty of FinTech solutions out there, right? Uh, they're scalable, they go, they, they go and capture a lot of demand. However, we still have the case for unbanked and underbanked people in the world. Now, and we will get a bit, uh, we will get into the topic a bit more with Chris in a moment. But let me just outline what is that we're trying to bring on the table today. The idea is very simple. Um, the fact that we, and I'll make a comparison with a quite known brand, Ferrari, right? The top car, everyone wants a Ferrari. A lot of people want a Ferrari, maybe not everyone, someone, the current, but it stays, you know that. And um, the fact that we are in a society where we could potentially, let's say, give a Ferrari to everyone, it doesn't mean that give a Ferrari to everyone, it is the right thing to do, especially if people don't have a driving license. It will just create a, a bigger mess out of what we actually exist. And I think this is the starting point. Um, and I will call it on the virtual stage on my uh, virtual stool close to me, Chris. Um, to briefly discuss what is financial inclusion and what would be, as you mentioned at the beginning, the role of financial education as well. Because of course, as far as we know it, financial inclusion means making financial products and services accessible to, for everyone, right? But also we need to think about the deep meaning of inclusive. That meaning including many different types of people, for example, which have to be treated fairly and equally. So my question to you, Chris, is do you think there is Disalignment today in the industry, or do you feel there is such gap? And I think you know, even Max suggested something about information. So maybe you want to start. We want to start from there. Yeah, I mean, let me start with the easy bit, which is financial inclusion. And I say that's the easy bit because we have seen, thanks to the mobile telephone, so many people in so many countries now having access to financial services that they never had before, and. You know, 10 years ago and today, it's the poorest people in the world that pay the most to transact with traders and finance because they typically have to do it physically with cash. And if they try and do it electronically because they don't have an account, they pay a huge proportion of the transaction as a fee to the account transactor. And that's something that's radically changed. Now you can pretty much move money by apps without bank accounts in real time um, globally. And some of that's driven by things that are happening with cryptocurrencies. Um, and so by way of example, the most popular usage as a 
application of blockchain and Bitcoin is in the migrant remittance worker space because it's immediate and costs very little by comparison with traditional remittance providers. But that brings me to the second area, which is financial literacy and inclusive finance and financial education. Because what we've also seen, and I'm reflecting on this a lot over the last year during lockdown, is huge amounts of money moving into Bitcoin and also all the other cryptocurrencies and equally into silly areas like doggy coin or doge coin, depending on how you want to call it, um, as well as into stupid stocks like GameStop and BlackBerry. Why is that happening? You know, it, CNN the other day had a headline, which is a small trader in New Jersey who provides um, a cafe that's transacted $35,000 over the last two years is now valued at over several hundred million dollars um, as a stock. This is to do with people uh, illustrating what's called the extraordinary madness of crowds and equally bucking the system because they don't like the system. And it's going to be interesting to see the carnage that comes out of this because my personal view is we will see a massive implosion of the madness of crowds in cryptocurrencies and stupid stocks and a lot of young people losing a lot of money because they're not educated in trade and investments in the way in which the old markets are and yes i'm an old guy so i'm bound to st say it that way and yeah i'm happy that they try and buck the system i just think that by bucking the system they'll lose their bucks Fair enough. That's a very good. That's a very good point. And I think on this one, I will just mention, you know, the definition of underbanked, which are those who struggle with like access and services. And one of the main challenges of these people is not really having access or not to financial services. It could be a transactional account or any other service. You know, you mentioned remittance, but it is very much understanding these products, right? Understanding how they work, what is their impact, um, and that's one side of it. And then, as you Chris mentioned, there is the you know, retail investor side of things. And I think on this one, I will call into the conversation, uh, Max as well, because what looks like to me, of course, is, is information and, you know, plays a, an important role, information, education. A lot of people educate themselves, not maybe following courses, but just reading through the news, right? So in, the, in, in 2021, we are bombarded by news every day. And the thing is, on one hand, it's very good because everyone has access to knowledge. But on the other hand, it can be really bad because can, you know people can get access to wrong knowledge, to wrong information, and as Chris mentioned, uh, you know make things worse. So, what do you think um, information stands these days, Max? Um, how do you think we could make it better in a way that people can screen better information and have access to what is relevant and what is correct? Well, I guess the short answer is the sign up for Finomize, but uh, I don't think that's what you're looking for. Um... <laughs> Uh, uh, no, I think, so first of all, I, I think that's sort of the, 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 the everlasting debate is, you know, is what's happening out there bad or good? And, and I guess at the end of the day, who are we to judge? Um, I think I would, I would sort of caveat um, what was just said a little bit. Um, I think, A, the research that we've done in our own community and, and also the research that we've, um, that we've seen from other people do is you know a lot of these new investors are not kids. I think the average age of these uh, of I, I quoted like 10 million um, retail investors in the U.S. Uh, last year alone. Uh, I think the average age is somewhere like 35 or above. Um, we always hear about these uh, 20 year olds who put all of their uh, savings uh, into a GME, but I think those are outliers, um, at least from the data that I've seen. Um, and then I think the thing is that there's a bit of a um, uh, there's a bit of a shift in paradigms, I think, um, between sort of the older generation of investors and, and, to, and the modern, quote unquote, modern generation of investors. And what I mean by that is like, what we see a lot in our own community is people learn by doing. Um, and so they, because of fractional shares and because of also crypto, but like a lot, all of these things that have been happening, they learn by doing, by putting you know, when people put money into uh, an altcoin or when people put money into Tesla or GME or any of these hype stocks, 
yes, there are people who put all of their money in there and you read their stories on Reddit and you think it's completely insane. Uh, but the majority of the people that we at least speak to, um, they put like a hundred pounds in there. Uh, and they're not being stupid about it, as I think often the media portrays it. They're not sort of idiots who who just plow everything into 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 an altcoin. They invest some tiny, tiny amounts because that gives them the feeling that they have some skin in the game, and that will actually help them learn. So that's it's this like we describe this as like the casual investor, so, and and the casual investor only has like very like 15 minutes a day uh, from what we've seen and they learn by doing um and i think that then to come to your to come to your question that's really what i think today's um sort of information society really needs to consider is building an information service that is for this um modern investor who's time poor who learns by doing and who cares about um the community uh, that that's that's very good, and you know that that's more at least from my point of view. The cor corporate like corporation, you have a company, you you look after financial information from a business perspective, right? Uh, I'll call in Chris again, and I'm asking, uh, what, you know, from your point of view, Chris, being more of a thought leader, being an influencer, a writer, like how do you make sure, or how can we make sure that there is the right flow of information also from you know, relevant people like you, for example, right? They have a voice in the industry and they don't mislead or maybe, you know, what they what they write, what they share is not misinterpreted by people who don't have enough knowledge to make their own evaluation. Yeah, I mean, I'll also pick up on, on Max's points. And I wasn't saying that it's kids um, in, in terms of 20 year olds, because um, I'm an old man, I call millennials kids. Um, so probably call you a kid. Um, so so what, what, I, what I was really getting at is how, yes, people learn from doing and um, they educate themselves by testing. But I've got people every day in my network saying, should I invest in Bitcoin? Should I buy Ether? Should I go and get some Dogecoin? And my answer is, you know, you, you can do that if you want, but it's absolutely quite ridiculous because you don't know the assets or the valuations or the details that go behind these currencies and i personally do believe that there is a strong future for some of them but today there's 2500 cryptocurrencies out there and equally there's a lot of betting on stocks that are completely worthless as fractional shares and a part of it's but back in the system because you're trying to push back on the short sellers but what I really think we should be doing is investing people in um, not value investing, which is the Warren Buffett way of the world, but in much more in how to actually manage money, the, you know, the basics of managing money, not speculating or doing casino gambling. You know, just in the last few days, Elon Musk uh, has just come out and said, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't believe in Bitcoin because it's burning the planet's energy. And the, the price went down 20% in you know, 12 hours. You know, that is not a stable structure for financial services. And I think we just need to have far more inclusive finance education so people know much more about if they're going to play about with these things, it is play versus where they should put their real money. Very good. Exactly. Very good. So... That 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 you know makes me think that is of course a, as we mentioned more of a social problem, right? And other than the information services, um, industry influencers, of course we have major institutions. Uh, we we have your two two representatives, um, Julian Stewart, and maybe I'll call you guys on my virtual stools if you guys wanna come and sit close to me. And I think my question to you is very much, you know, from an institutional point of view, right? What we discussed so far, um, what, what do you see in the industry from your experience, but also how do you think your institutions or institutions in general are tackling this kind of issue? Because it sounds to me, you know, we, we know there is so much going on also from a regulatory perspective, both in the um, securities market, but also crypto space. Um, there is an MICA regulation coming up in 2024. Hopefully, there is going to regulate a bit more um, crypto derivatives. So, other than without even getting too complicated, right? But in general, how do you see the institutional players try and facing the uh, financial inclusion issues and which kind of solutions is in the market?
You want okay. me to start, Andrea? Yeah, Julia Stewart, yeah. Cool, Cut sure. Julia. Thank you, thank you, Stuart. So, um, financial inclusion uh, <clears throat> today is uh, very much into the DNA and the narrative of big organizations, including, uh, including MasterCard. Um, how I try to dissect uh, uh, the value chain on financial inclusion is uh, um, a little bit as follows. First, I think about the infrastructure. And I think Max uh, mentioned that at the beginning. Infrastructure uh, that uh, big uh, technology players uh, put on the table uh, um, around the card network, ACH, blockchain, open banking. Then I think about distribution uh, of this platform and the uh, fintech uh, here for me play a huge role in distribution uh, of financial services and financial products. And then we go into the adoption of those services which then led to financial education. So I'll try to kind of dissect uh, into four buckets. And uh, uh, financial education is a fascinating topic uh, for me personally. Um, I, think, uh, I think there is a huge amount of uh, work to be done uh, across the globe. And, uh, and, um, but let me share with you a little bit uh, my experience. Uh, I worked in the Middle East and Africa and now in Latin America in the last six years. Uh, in emerging markets and uh, what we are uh, seeing for example in latin america is something uh, uh, incredible uh, we have unbanked and underbanked population 45 percent of the population is unbanked or underbanked only 19 percent of the population has access to credit but we have a fertile ground for uh, uh, for financial inclusion we have uh, a friendly regulatory environment we have uh, a young population uh, millennials will be 75% of the working, uh, the workforce by 2025. And these are digitally native uh, uh, guys and girls. Uh, we have a good connection, cash usage, as uh, some of you were mentioning, is still very, very high. Um, and uh, there has been huge amount of investments uh, into fintechs that are kind of facilitating uh, infrastructure, distribution, and adoption uh, kind of uh, exercise. Uh, there are some names that maybe are not well known by some uh, uh, people in the audience uh, in Latin America, from Mercado Libre, who is the Amazon of uh, Latin America, which is a huge player, listed company, which uh, really created something amazing. We have Nubank in Brazil, which went from a garage idea to a 40 million uh, customer providing credit uh, to unbanked, underserved, and today one of the biggest financial players in Brazil, a huge success story. We have uh, Walla in Argentina that started as a small uh, prepaid issuers to provide a simple prepaid card for people in Argentina just to access uh, Uber, Netflix, and basic services. Now they have uh, three, four million customers. They are challenging the traditional banks and they are a fantastic distribution uh, uh, kind of channel. Uh, what are these guys doing? They created a simple value proposition. They were able to go to market efficiently, and now they're building on this base of customers to provide other services, insurance, uh, uh, savings accounts, uh, and, uh, and, and that goes along with the old financial education <laughs> discussion that we're having. If I step back for a moment and I think about to your question, uh, um, uh, Andrea, about what uh, Mastercard, for example, is doing. Uh, financial inclusion is part of the narrative constantly. It's part of the DNA. We have been uh, in the, let me say, in the business of inclusion for years. Uh, and uh, the real, really, the, our goal is to bring a social impact at scale. We have uh, publicly committed to kind of some financial inclusion goals, bringing 1 billion people into the digital economy by 2025. We committed 250 million to SMEs uh, to bring them. Uh, uh, into the digital world. Uh, we are partnering with more than 100 uh, governments across the globe uh, for digital disbursement. And uh, we launch initiatives more in the financial education space, kind of called, uh, like the one called the Girls for Tech, where we bring technologists uh, and STEM uh, kind of practices into schools across the globe, uh, which is really a fantastic program. And 
really would like you to kind of explore that a little bit if you have some time, some spare time, because it's uh, it's incredible. So, I, I to conclude, uh, I think that uh, uh, it's a combination of digital inclusion and financial inclusion. Uh, I think that the the, the 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 aim of this big corporation in general should really be to drive more access to the internet, to lower the cost of tech, uh, to address the lack of digital skills on top of uh, uh, the financial inclusion aspect that we are discussing here today. And MasterCard has always been a company, you know, involved both in uh, proper fintech because involved in technology, but in financial services. So you had this kind of exposure. I think from the other perspective, it's interesting to hear from you, Stuart, like what about a bank? Because banks, of course, they're becoming more and more technology companies these days. Lloyd Blankfein from Goldman Sachs said some time ago, you know, we're we're not we're a technology company, we're not a bank. That's how you would define it. So my question is, how are you guys doing? Uh, how are you tackling this at Barclays uh, or anyway? What is your personal experience in the industry from the banking side of things? Yeah. Okay. So, firstly, I, I really like to general point around inclusion being built into the DNA and narrative of large institutions. And, and to build on it, I'd, I'd also say that inclusion means different things in different markets. So the, the drivers for unbanked and underbanking are different in different markets. Um, income is, is sort of uh, consistent uh, as a driver, but there's also things such as uh, age, you know, too young, too old, um, to be adequately served by the, the existing um, products that are offered, um, maybe your income is inconsistent, maybe there are processes which exclude people who don't, for example, hold required documentation. I remember when I first moved here, I needed a, uh, a bank account in order to start renting and the proof of residence to get a bank account. And uh, you can't get your proof of residence until you start renting. So I was stuck in this sort of circular reference. <laughs> um, to, to speak for a moment just more specifically about what Barclays offers. So we, uh, as much as Andrea, you say that um, we have this sort of notion that we're now a tech company, some of our solutions are very low tech as well, uh, intentionally. So some of, the, some of the things that we offer is uh, money mentors, so free and impartial help. Um, available to customers and non-customers on topics ranging from the basics of budgeting to the complexities of buying your first home. So um, I encourage everyone on the call, if you're uh, if you're in the UK, go check out Barclays Money Mentors, um, if you have anything that we could maybe help you with. And next up, so Life Skills is a, our flagship education program with a, a focus on helping young people gain skills and knowledge to improve their employability. Um, preparing a good CV, et cetera, um, as, as having a, an inclusion aspect with people who land jobs and uh, are able to um, progress themselves, but also more likely to become financially included. Um, so just taking, taking the Barclays hat off for a second, though, speaking about um, more, a few more general observations, if I may. In, in my observation, it, it's not about the technology, it's about people and understanding what financial needs they have and how it's currently being met. Only then, once you understand how they're currently meeting these needs, can you then ask, well, is there a way for technology to do this better? Um, secondly, the, the topic of this discussion is phrased in a really interesting way, from financial inclusion to inclusive finance. And to my mind, this is all about building financial products and services that are inclusive for everyone by design from the very beginning rather than trying to augment what you built yesterday in an attempt to make it work for a customer base that it was not initially designed to work for. So this whole notion of inclusion by default, not by exception. Um, and just when, when, and maybe, maybe Julia, you've had similar experience in, uh, in the developing markets, but the importance of a profit noted. So, when your access to the financial system is dependent on a continued charity of someone else, then you're in a pretty precarious situation indeed. Um, yeah. Building inclusive products by design for the whole market, rather than trying to uh, fit your existing product to work for a, a, a base that it wasn't intended to, building for the whole all at once means that it forces you to retain the profit motive in your, in your mind, because you can't afford to lose money on 100% of your customer base. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, 
Hand it back to you, Andrea. Thank you. No, very, very insightful. Um, and I think, you know, I will pick up on your contribution, guys. Um, and I'll, I'll try to play the devil's advocate here. Um, you know, I've, I've been working with startups quite a lot, uh, but also with big corporations in different industries. Uh, something that we always um, kind of hear is that big corporations are really slow to, to adapt. They're slow to uh, innovate. They're slow to do everything because of their size, right? We, we've seen this in banking. We've seen this, you know, with fintech especially, again, um, a lot of uh, leaner players getting into the market, being able to innovate and change something that at the end of the day wasn't rocket science, really but the execution and the time to market make, that made the whole difference. Um, and now on this one, I will call Sam and Vivek so to understand how you guys from the fintech space and you know the uh, fancy entrepreneurship uh, points of view, you guys feel uh, this problem is being tackled. And again, like especially you are in first line every day. Um, so what do you see happening in the industry from your perspective and what the challenges in your opinion are to actually reach out to these people and make sure that everyone is up to speed with financial literacy um, and, and knowledge, thus inclusion. Yeah, sure, I can. I, I don't mind going first on this. So, f first of all, I'd, I'd say that I think um, startups are going to be really key to, to kind of bridging gaps that are out there when it comes to inclusion. Um, I think, you know, just by virtue of being able to focus on narrower markets, move at speed, take on risks, that bigger incumbents um, don't really want to kind of focus on. Uh, I think there's kind of very interesting entry points and opportunities for startups to focus on. Um, and I guess the, the kind of very straightforward answer to, to kind of how startups can help with inclusion are to essentially... Uh, <laughs> In, include either through products or services those who those, those who are excluded um you know i think a number of people have said that um uh you know there's that you know f inclusivity means different things in different markets and uh, you see uh, different startups doing different things in different markets i think broadly uh, the way we look at things that the kind of financial landscape is that we see there's there's almost like a whole world of, of manufacturing financial products uh, you know, whether it be a bank account, whether it be a mortgage product, a, a loan, whatever it may be, where there's a huge amount of innovation taking place. Uh, and there's different layers of that, right? There, there, are, there are startups who are providing basic building blocks of infrastructure that then other companies make, which, which make the lives of other companies a lot easier. Uh, whether it be, you know, processing payments or KYC or money transfer or whatever it may be. Uh, and then I think there's a whole other kind of area of, of innovation and, and, and um, really impact when it comes to inclusivity, which is all to do, uh, I think Julia was talking about this earlier, around distribution. Uh, you know, how can you uh, essentially be really effective at getting, uh, you know, the right products into the right, in, in, into, into the customer's hands at the right time and the right amounts? Uh, how do you match all of that up? How do you provide that intelligence or almost like operating system where, you know, historically, if you, if you talk about what we're doing here at Multiply, historically, uh, this used to be done either through speaking to friends and family, uh, reading blogs or newspapers or speaking to a financial advisor. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's so much scope there now for technology to kind of get involved and almost be that operating system, that intelligence layer, that mass market such that, you know, the default for people's finances aren't what they've been to date, which is generally pretty bad and suboptimal. Uh, you know, the default setting of people's finances can be, can be very good. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's going to be a really, really critical, uh, kind of really critical place for, for startups to play. And just linked to that, there's also like a really strong element of technology playing its role. You know, I, a number of people earlier on talked about... Uh, you know, the internet, mobile phones, uh, being enablers, you know, going going into the future, AI, crypto will be, uh, re you know, really big enablers as well. Um, but kind of really leveraging that, you know, being like doing a really good job of your personal finances uh, isn't just kind of a, a, you know, look at it one day and, and just like put it all in order and, and that's it for, for the next 30 years. It takes, you know, uh, you know uh, interventions almost every month to kind of do a really good job. And 
once you kind of set up a system, essentially a broad system for do your, for doing your finances really well, that's where, you know, technology, that's where, uh, you know, a, a great app or whatever it may be that's linked to all this fantastic infrastructure can really play uh, a role in, in, in kind of helping people uh, and, and include them in, I guess, the world of doing your finances well, of, 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 uh, of doing a really good job. Um, yeah, that, that's kind of my thinking around that. Fair enough, fair enough. And, and you, Sam, what is your take on this one? The, the biggest problem I see in financial inclusion is the knowledge gap between those who have the financial education of how the system works and, and those who don't. We, we live in a society where, especially in the UK, more than half of the country has less than £100 lifetime savings. Uh, most people are very stressed about their financial situation on a daily basis. Um, most of them couldn't afford to have just an increase of 100 pound expenses and, and pay their bills. And what was the most striking to me is, although I studied master's degree in engineering, I did MBA, I was never taught how to think about money. And it's only when I worked in investment banking that I realized how the system works. And the most striking is the banks and the rich people, when you look at how they get rich, and then when you compare it to, to the rest of the population, they actually do the exact opposite things. They use different financial products and they, they, and they do different, they make different decisions. Most people consider that money is something to be spent. And that's, that's mostly the, the dominant narrative. So the default to everything that I earn, I'm going to spend it. What actually they don't realize is the most people who get rich and have money working for them is because money makes money and actually it makes money very quickly. And when, when you know that, when you know that actually the money that you save can build your financial freedom, can make you safer for the future, then it completely changes how you see your money and how you see your, your finances. So um, what we're trying to do is to show to people that they don't need to be, um, to accept the, the, this way of living of trying to spend every single pound that uh, they earn because that's what they, they default to. And actually there's a path to financial freedom. They can get, um, they can get more confidence with their money. They don't have to be living paycheck to paycheck. And actually they would feel much better because the, um, when people default just to, to spend everything that they earn and they, they miss out all of the, the, the power of money, which is to, 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 to make more money. And I think, it, I think that anyone if they really want to be sustainable and have a healthy lifestyle, can be financially free, free of debt, free of money worries, and build a system that is working for them in the long term. And I'll pick on this one, right? Um, I think what I heard so far, it's all uh, like it's all great and kind of goes along with what we're trying to what we're trying to express and solve for here. But that's exactly where then my flip side comes in and I'll pick a very specific example. So there is a, a sub industry of FinTech that is exploding, especially that's been exploding, especially in the last month, which is the buy now, pay later solution, right? And, and, and that's where it gets tricky because that's exactly, I think the perfect example of the Ferrari that I was given at the beginning. So we have a tool and I, I tested myself Okay, I just bought like some something on like like some probably over like some proteins or something like that. And I came across on the website and it was offering the buy now and then you pay later. So I was like, okay, let's try it. And it was so easy that it was it actually scary how easy it was for me to just get straight pay and not pay and then just get subnet. Now this was for a very small uh, small amount of money, right? But in a world, what they, as you described, Sam, in a world where most of the people, uh, they either, you know, unbanked or underbanked or they're anyway under a kind of living wage situation, how do then we make sure that these services like buy now, pay later are not a curse rather than a bless? 
So what, what do you think, Sam? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Yeah. The, so in the investment banking, there, there was a very wide wa uh, big wave of regulations by the regulators, ESMA, et cetera. That was obliging banks to, to make sure that their customers understand the product. And it was particularly relevant when they were selling complicated structured product to pension fund, man pension fund managers, et cetera, that it was actually uh, so hard to understand what's, what's behind. And what we don't tell to people is spending can become an addiction. Absolutely, absolutely. And the, but this is exactly in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the and, it, and when you buy a pack of cigarette or when you buy alcohol, it's kind of clear you need to show your license, you need to be uh, adult, etc. Smoke, smoking kids and you, you see like some horrific pictures of lung cancers and any and blah 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 but when when uh, financial products to buy stuff with money that you don't have like Klarna and others are sold to people they're just sold as very glamorous get what you want right now and it, it gives it gives the impression to people that it's fine to buy stuff with money that you don't have. Like there's no repercussion. And so 90% of the buy now, pay later is, is not used to pay groceries. 90% is to buy fashion. And fashion in the lockdown, well, you can hardly argue that it was the basic necessity. So it's mostly used to, for people to get some dopamine rush. That's what most shopping is, dopamine rush and retail therapy. And the problem is most people who use that, they, they don't necessarily understand the long-term impact. They don't understand interest rate, compounded interest rate, and how it plays in, in their future. What they see is, oh, great. I can buy this, this, this. It's so easy. It's less friction. But there's always a downside when you remove friction. You remove the friction from buying. Well, you also remove the need of thinking, oh, do I need that? Would that make me happy? Will that make me happy right now or even for the future me? Fair enough. I, I would like to open it a bit to the panel on this one. Uh, if there is any one of you um, guys that wants to add something, because I feel, uh, you know, given the level of knowledge that we have here, I'm sure you all have your, uh, your idea around this buy now, pay later service, which, you know, kind of resembles the credit cards business really. Uh, so I, I don't know if Julio wants, you know, being on the space, wants to, um, wants to comment on that or anyone else, whoever feels, um, wants to have anything. Don't be shy. Well, I'll weigh in as no one else is in that, um, I think buy now, pay later is being hyped to something bad and what's the difference between it and the credit card industry. Um, the main difference is the risk assessment. But Klarna works on a risk assessment based on data analytics. And although it's got some bad reputation, I think it's actually been hyped out, out of proportion. Um, and equally, I've known Klarna since they started. So I think they're quite a responsible company and they're not as irresponsible as they're being made out in the media. And equally, as I listen to the conversation so far. One of the interesting things to me is uh, meeting Henry Ma, who's the CIO of WeBank in China. He's very proud of the fact that they can administer a bank account for 47 cents a year, less than half a US dollar. And he does that based on what he calls the ABCD of technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain distributed ledger, cloud, and data analytics. And those technologies are combining to make banking, basic banking in particular, cheap and easy for everybody. So I think as Max um, mentioned earlier, um, or maybe Sam, you know, that it, it's expensive to run a bank account. It's not expensive, except the onboarding process. And what's interesting from that perspective is we've seen um, N26 get their knuckles wrapped from Baffin, the German regulator, for not adhering to client onboarding regulations after two years of being warned that that's an issue. And at the moment, I'm seeing Monzo closing down many of their client accounts 
because they haven't done the due diligence of client onboarding. And it's that part of getting the client on board that's been the expensive barrier to banking. Uh, but I'll come back to buy now, pay later, because I think that industry will um, flourish and form into something that could actually be an alternative to credit cards over time. But they need to do it in a way that's far more responsible than it's been done today, because as mentioned, it makes it far too easy to spend money you don't have. Um, having said that, as I say, if you've got the data analytics, which Klarna does have, then it's not irresponsible. Yeah, just maybe <clears throat> adding uh, a couple of reflection on this uh, uh, super fascinating topic. Uh, uh, as a finance profession, I think cash flow management uh, is fundamental. Uh, not only because it's a day in, a day out what I do, but uh, I'm sure all of you founders uh, and uh, um, kind of professionals, uh, I think education around cash flow management is really the, the name of the game when we talk about uh, uh, payment uh, solutions. Um, I think I really like the concept that Sam was uh, uh, elaborating around the nurturing your savings, right? So learn to save first, uh, teach key concept about compounded interest. Uh, the fact that you can really at zero cost uh, saving accounts that give you something instead of keeping uh, cash under, under the mattress. Uh, today you can invest uh, through ETF. So really low cost uh, ability to access uh, uh, the stock market without going into the fashionable and more risky stuff that we were discussing before. So I, I think that uh, on this uh, nurturing your savings kind of concept, uh, there is a lot to do, uh, a lot to learn, and um, and it's a huge opportunity. Thank you, Julio. Um, I, I I know we're kind of overrunning a bit. Uh, I also I also think that you know being very interested in the topic, I would like to just touch on one last final point um, and challenge all of you here. I, I kind of have a guess who's gonna take the, who's gonna take it first, but we will see. Um, so. You know, we think about solutions, how to reach a very large amount of people that can, can't access um, financial product, don't have access to, uh, you know, on a, from a retail perspective, even payment systems, right? Uh, in regions where probably the infrastructure, is something that came up as well earlier during the panel, uh, is, not, is not very well developed. Now, um, as you all know, tokenization, cryptos, digital money, Bank of England being one of many banks that are exploring, um, you know, the CBDC, uh, central bank digital money, digital currencies, um, and many others all around the world. So if we think about fractional, uh, fractional shares, fractional investment, the access that everyone has through digital products, my question is, how do you think can cryptos, digital money, tokens play a role in the financial inclusion. So, for example, if you think of a society or a region where in order to give access to people, we give them access to tokens, but they only earn tokens based on the financial knowledge that they have, for example, right? If they take courses, if they score a certain amount of points by learning and so on and so forth. So what do you see if you see them at all fitting digital money and cryptos in this um in this type of ecosystem and i think maybe chris you want to start on this one <laughs> i'm always happy to start um so th the question you're really asking is britcoin or bitcoin because a central bank digital currency or any corporate currencies will be permissioned and centralized probably using Ethereum smart contracts or something that develops and evolves from it, the Ethereum platform um, over the next decade versus democratized, decentralized and distributed currencies based on something like Bitcoin, which will solve its energy issues over time. And the real thing around this is what is it that you value and trust now? I've grown up in a, in a state system with borders where I believe in governments. 
but I think that is shifting in that I've said for a long time in a global network that doesn't recognize nation states and borders, you need a global currency, but you can't have currencies without government. So it's the government thing that's the interesting friction right now in terms of do you need a permission network run by a central bank or a permissionless network run or a permissionless currency run by the network? And that's what this moment of time is where we're going through. It's very likely that by the 2030s, just like if you think about the 1990s, there will be some very strong new structures of exchanging value, some of which will be nation state operated, maybe on Ethereum and permissioned, but there will definitely be at least one currency that will be run on as a global currency for the network. How and who runs that currency is the question. Very good point. Oh, someone. Oh, okay, it was just my class. Very, very good point. And I think this is the challenge, right? Understanding how to develop, how to make sure that there is something that is going to be also acceptable because we've seen one of the main challenges of Bitcoin at the beginning and all the other cryptos is exactly this uh, lack of something that we're very used to being the government or the middleman or you know any 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 kind of institution that uh kind of serves um for the purpose of regulating um i don't know if anyone else in the panel feels like adding anything on this bit or something that you have seen in your space maybe the institutional space no i mean i think i would add just uh, very briefly that i think um although i'm not a crypto um expert by sort of or like a fanatic like there are people out there i think there's a lot of really interesting use cases that could evolve for example if you think about tokenized stocks um uh, would not only allow sort of 24 7 uh, access uh, to them but would also broaden the access uh, when it comes to perhaps people in developing countries uh, getting access to to stocks uh, in in New York, for example, at a price um, much much lower than they would normally pay, uh, and so I think there's and, and you know not even to speak of any kind of like government regulations um, that might hinder them, um, and so I think there's a lot of really interesting opportunity. Uh, the question obviously will be how these use cases will be shaped, etc. Um, but the opportunity is there. Uh, and I think a lot of these things currently are very much in this like toy phase uh, where they look like toys, um, but, and, but the technology, it looks very promising and the toy has the potential to turn into really, really powerful technology. And so that would be, from my point of view, the key question, will it make that transition or will it remain a toy? Nice. Thank you. Any anyone else that feels like want to add anything short? Two again. Yeah. Or... Uh, just to so again, quick disclaimer, I, I am not a blockchain or Bitcoin expert, but I, I think to to Max's point, there are a few interesting use cases um that I that I can sort of foresee. One one that would really help is around identity. How do we help people prove who they are um to third parties? Um, so that we can help to, among other things, reduce the cost of onboarding, uh, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, another one is around uh, the reduction of friction through for large transactions, such as um, I have recently sold sold my apartment in Johannesburg and uh, it took weeks to get through the deeds office. Can't help but thinking that uh, you know there's probably a use case there for blockchain to help um, speed up the transfer of uh, of assets, such as uh, immovable property. Nice. Right. So <clears throat> this kind of takes us to the to the end of this panel. I think it was very interesting to hear from all of you the different experiences, but also the different points of view on the on the topic. Um, I do believe we could spend other probably two hours uh, digging deeper and deeper into into the topic, into the experiences. Um, what, what I feel like is more like as a also as a conclusion of this is. There is so there is very much going on. Um, institutions, startups, uh, entrepreneurs, thought leaders like there is there is a wide and clear understanding of what the challenge is. 
um, and what the challenges will be um, going forward. Uh, for sure, it's something that needs a lot of work. There is a lot of um, need for education and, um, you know, like kind of teach people and go to the right places and look for the right audience and bring the right message to the right audience. So there is a lot of also like behavioral training that has to be done, right, uh, in terms of spending, investing and managing their money. Uh, it's definitely a lively uh, environment. It's definitely a lively space. Um, I do personally believe, which is why my interest that my interest got moved into this specific topic. Um, you know, there is so much that is going on already, also in different forms, and there a lot of other things will come up. Uh, and it's definitely a space to watch. Now, I want to thank everyone, all the panelists. Uh, your insights were uh, were amazing, and I think you know, for everyone that followed from beginning to end. I'm sure they'll leave today with something more um, and something that they learned. But before before we head away, uh, we leave space to a small Q and A session. Um, so everyone is free to unmute and just ask right away because I cannot see um, the chat function either. So I think that's the that's the only way you can uh, you can get into the conversation. So if there is anyone that feels like you know wants us to discuss something a bit more or there is a doubt out of our conversation, please ask right away. And don't be shy. You, you can keep your cam closed so we don't know who it is. I would just, you know. No one? So I assume it was crystal clear. Okay, that's, I, I think that, that's great. I think there's a lot of information to, con to consume, a lot of wisdom. Um, the, I know that everyone who's joined from the Eventbrite, you can see all the speakers and their, their LinkedIn contacts, which is brilliant. Um, I, I just want to say, Andrea, thank you so much for uh, bringing up the idea and putting these amazing speakers together. It's, it's just an absolute pleasure to listen to really interesting people from all different sectors and also in different parts of fintech. Um, this is, you know, this is what we do and it's been thoroughly enjoyable for anyone out there that wants to get in touch with us, just go to, you know, to rise.barclays. Um, that's where our website is about what we do here at rise. And we have these sessions all the time, but I leave the final word to you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, again, very excited. I think it was really interesting. I'm happy you recorded this because I'm, I'm going to be very, very much looking forward to sharing with my network. Um, it's definitely an open conversation. So as Tony mentioned, feel free to get in touch with all of us um, and, you know, ask right away if you have any doubt or if there is any idea that you think might be relevant to the topic. Excellent. Thank you all very, very much and have a fantastic weekend. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.